So here we go. Welcome to the 33rd episode of The Smartest People in the Room. If you've been following this series, you understand what we are doing, shining a light on incredibly smart, accomplished people, helping them share stories from their careers and lives, as well as anecdotes about their past, present, and future. Today, I am thrilled to revisit one of the most successful events that Who Knew has ever done, or actually has done five times, and that's exploring the world of music supervision and sync licensing. Before we get started, let me take care of a little bit of business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Some of you may know that I am a music industry headhunter. By definition and function, I help people connect with companies. In this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of the opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the interview itself. I wanna thank our sponsors for without their support, we couldn't do what we do. Thank you to First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, the Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Four Roses Bourbon, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and also Organics. With that out of the way, let's get today's program started. Today's interview is my good friend, Liz Rogers. Liz is, co -found, is founder and creative director of Anna Crucis, where she oversees new signings, writer development, and pitching creative, creatively for Sync. A graduate of Vanderbilt University, Liz studied music performance, musical theater, business, and education, and has applied all those skills in jobs in experiential marketing and consulting. In addition to Anna Crucis, Liz also is an independent music supervisor and has worked on several films and documentaries and is a member of the Guild of Music Supervisors. She's an adjunct professor at Van Vanderbilt University and the associate event music event producer for the Nashville Film Festival an advisor at the Entrepreneur Center and serves on the alumni board for SOLID, which is Society of Leaders in Development. Liz was recently honored as Nashville, as one of Nashville's 30 under 30 and was recognized by the Nashville Business Journal on the esteemed power players list, Women in Music City. On a wow, Liz. Level, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> and on a personal level, Liz has partnered with me in producing our annual Who Knew Presents at The Pitch, an evening with music supervisors, which is our take on Shark Tank. Annually, it's our most popular event, and due to the pandemic, we can't do it this year, but we will return to City Winery in 2021 for sure. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know I'd have to, like, watch my bio being read to me. Everyone just, like, watched my face during that. But. This is your life. <laughs> Lizzie. And joining Liz as today's very special guest is Evian Clean. Evian is music supervisor at Neophonic Inc., a premium music supervision company based in Los Angeles. He's an Emmy Award winner, seven-time Guild of Music Supervisor Award winner, as well as five-time Hollywood Music and Media Award nominee. He founded Neophonic in 1980 and was involved in the areas of artist management, music publishing, record labels, and recording studios where he developed a reputation of vast musical knowledge, experience, and strong relationships throughout the entertainment community. Eventually shifting the company's focus to music supervision, Evian has since supervised and consulted for over 100 films and thousands of hours of television. From full service soundtrack production and supervision to creative and technical consultation, he's worked with nearly every major film and TV studio network and independent alike. Evian and team at Neophonic have had the pleasure of consulting for HBO for over 24 years, working with dozens of award-winning directors, producers, composers, as well as producing music with countless numbers of musical artists. Evian is music supervisor on the global phenomenon television series, Game of Thrones, 
He also supervises HBO's Chernobyl and Deadwood, as well as Warrior for Cinemax and Netflix, The Last Thing He Wanted. Other recent credits include What's My Name, Muhammad Ali, The Wizard of Lies, and Elvis Presley, The Searcher. Evian is member of the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, NARIS, AFI, ASCAP, and BMI. He has won too many awards to read here, so I'm going to let Liz and him kick the program off. Welcome to both of you rock stars. Thank you, Tom. I feel old. Well, like, you are when I heard all of that and you said you're 19 years old, my God, I've been doing this a long time. Lord have mercy. It a long time. <laughs> so do you want me to just jump in? Tom, do you have any kickoff questions? Take it away. This is your program. All right. Well, I'll start with just um, a little bit of backstory. I mean, obviously, we know Neophonic as a music supervision company, but you actually started Neophonic with your brother, right, as a, a label and publishing company. So what, can you uh, tell uh, us what some of those uh, early about days were like? <laughs> A very long time ago, um, we had a recording studio in the outskirts of Hollywood in a little town called Lamita, close to Redondo Beach. And um, we had bands like Dred Scott and The Germs and X. And uh, my brother was in a, a new wave punk band called Zamp and the Suspects. And, we, you know, printed vinyl and we toured and we got our asses kicked and uh, enjoyed it all along the way um, for, for years. So there was some record management and publishing work there. And then years later, uh, a friend of mine wrote a script, uh, Carl Schaefer, and uh, he came home. We were roommates at the time um, and said, I sold my script, you got to help me with the music. And that started the shift to music supervision um, with a show called TV 101 at the beginning of the 90s. Um, which then again, I say that and I go, wow, been doing this for a, for a long time. Uh, I partnered up with Paul Brusek, who is the president of Warner Brothers Pictures now, but then we were clean Brusek music. For a decade, he moved on to New Line as an in-house executive, and uh, just when he was doing that, we had done something for HBO, and HBO continued coming to me and asking me for help on some of the projects, which turned into an overall consulting deal, and then, you know, now 25 years later, we are basically the de facto music department for HBO, besides doing independent things when a, a friend, a director, or a producer that we have a good relationship is doing something, um, we try to be there for our friends. And so we do some things outside of the HBO world, but um, HBO is super busy and we spend the majority of our time uh, making all those projects work as the de facto music part. Yeah, going back to obviously working when Neophonic first started, sidebar, I love the name Neophonic. I don't know if people know, it's the Greek word or Greek, it means new sound. And anachrusis yeah. actually comes from similar origin. Anachrusis is the Greek word for beginning of a song. Uh, wow, that's and way cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm Greek. So, um, you know, the publishing company was Simendria Music, which, which is a small town in Greece a little village in Greece where my grandparents came from. Um, and so my brother and I elected that as the publishing company name and Neophonic as the label name. And, uh, and uh, Neophonic followed the uh, music supervision over. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, do you but, feel like some of those early days working in the studio, like cutting your teeth with those punk bands, really paved the way for your intensity of like working with artists and writers in the studio? Cause I know that's a big thing of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of facets to music supervision. There's, it's good to have a lot of tools, you know, there's, there's, there's picking a song, there's 
um, clearing that song, there's producing music, there's hiring a composer, there's being on set, there's being in the studio, there's lots of things. And those early days, and you're, 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 to your point, you're talking about um, being in the studio, it's still my favorite place, you know, to be with, with artists and musicians and, and working on helping create something. Uh, that along with being on the set or working with the director or a producer trying to crack the nut, like how it's going to work visually and, and all of that stuff, I de de definitely comes from, and I think the foundation of what we do at Neophonic was based on working in all those different types of music mediums, if that makes sense, you know, for the business side and the creative side and the studio logistics side and, you know, uh, budgeting and all of those things that you have to pay attention to um, re really became, I think uh, Paul and I, when we were partners and we would have someone come in and work through the, you know, they have to go through the, the, the school of clean Brusek music, which is, you need to be a bit versed in all of that stuff. It's not, it's not going to your record collection and picking a tune. There's a little bit more to that. Um, not, not that every music supervisor needs to have all of the tools, but if, if you're doing something that's music intensive, like a Bessie Smith or something, it's good to have, be able to rely on um, being comfortable with all of those music situations. And how did you meet Paul? Was his background similar to yours at the time you guys came together? Well, that's interesting. So when I did the first television show, my roommate um, said, you got to help me with the music, and he brought in his friend as a producer editor who is friends with Paul and said oh and I have a really cool music person too so we kind of met and did the pilot together um, was introduced by those producers and uh, worked together for a decade remained incredibly close friends he's my best friend I was the uh, best man at his wedding you know we remain incre incredibly close and we happen to now both be working under the Warner Media umbrella, uh, me on the HBO side and him on the Warner Bros. Picture side. So yeah, kind of it's so kind of, kind of wild. We have conversations and we think back and like what a long, strange trip it's been. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, two, three decades now coming up. So easy, what's Liz. When you, yes. <laughs> um, what's interesting to me about that first show, even your first foray into music supervision is you were already kind of discovering bands. You were the, one of the first people to license YouTube. You've always kind of in that, that show. And can you talk about some of how, like how you found some of those early bands and were you always kind of ahead of the curve with? So I, I think it's, I, I mean, it's not unlike good music supervisors now that, that are listening to music before they, it's, it breaks and, kind of being in front of it and having relationships with people and say, hey, we just signed this band, hey, we've done this, or check this out. Um, it was interesting because, you know, music supervision wasn't a, you know, uh, uh, a household topic. It wasn't really, you know, yeah, the, I mean, when the, you were the, so there was people that were doing it. Um, and when w we first uh, started to do it, it literally was like, what do I, what do I like? how in tune am I with my director and uh, hunting around with my music friends to like find new, new stuff. And, and the YouTube track came, Carl Schaefer, who wrote the pilot of TV 101, wrote that into the script. And then we had to go track down and figure it out and get it cleared. But we, we loved finding bands like i mean i think when we were doing early days of baywatch we found seal and a few other bands before anybody really knew who they were and put them in the show and that's not unlike some soups now that are dealing with contemporary yeah. shows but um a, a lot a lot of fun very rewarding when you're helping someone that you like a lot musically uh get some exposure it was a little different you know in that there were a lot of bands that back in the day that getting your stuff in TV was a little different than now. Now it's a very big marketing tool. You know, it was a little bit like, oh, that's, we're, we're rock and rollers. It's, you know, it's not that cool. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. If, yeah. if that was 
some pushback, especially with Baywatch and some of those shows that were very music intensive. Yeah, you know, the, and, and you know, I remember having to convince when Kings of Leon first came out, um, we were doing um, uh, a television show for Sean Ryan, and um, I p pitched it. He wanted to use it, and then they were like, "Nah, we don't really want." But we kept working on them and got them to do it. it was a great use and you know it, t it took a lot more educating and uh using your connections now, now it's very much you know a product manager's toolbox in his marketing to to you know help help bands break help new records you know m move um a different a different beast um so it's creatively somewhat the same but just it's a it's a it's a lot easier um, to there's no com not, not as much convincing uh, yeah. to artists these days that, that yeah, they sure. they understand and and so do the labels and publishers. Yeah, they doesn't necessarily mean the quote will be affordable, but it but they do understand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's so interesting how I mean that one of the things that I wanted to chat about was how the relationship between just the public and music supervisors has changed since you started your career. The public being just general, I mean, like now high school students know music supervision is a career, but also obviously the music industry and how that you're now being inundated. And how, how do you feel that that has affected your role as a music supervisor or not at all? Well, I will say just to your point, um, we have so many um, applications for internships, you know, um, usually at the co college level, but lots and lots and lots of people that are turning because they want to explore the idea of being a music supervisor. And I think earlier, some of those internships were, were looking, I'm looking to get a, a job at a label or a publisher job or, or or a, in a, a gig at a studio, um, uh, but now it, the predominantly people that are applying to try to be an internship, and we have certain rules. You have to be in school. There's California labor laws. You know we have to abide by. But they very much want to explore music supervision um, as a career. And once they realize really what it's about, then they change their minds and go in a different direction. I'm kidding, but okay. but but it is eye it is eye opening. It is eye-opening. It's not just about your record collection. Yeah, for sure. And it's not just picking a song, which so many people obviously think it is. Right. I mean, that is part of it, and that is fun, but yeah. Yes. So you touched on um, kind of being the de facto music house for HBO. Um, how Can you tell us a bit more about that, some of those early projects and how that relationship evolved over the years? Because now, obviously, you're kind of the go-to. Yeah, so we – it was – we're seven people now um, and we started just by doing some of the film projects for HBO and a, a miniseries and um, and that's grown over over the the years we we, we don't just music su supervise and as a matter of fact there's many projects that we don't music supervise but our job is to evaluate the scripts, evaluate the projects, understand what the filmmaker's needs are, and advise accordingly. So we might break down and help budget a series or a movie, uh, and then realize that that project needs a specific music supervisor, or the filmmakers have one they like to work with, so we help facilitate that. Sometimes our job is to actually music supervise. People say, well, why don't you guys do it? And I said, okay, well, fine. You know, whatever whatever casting makes the most sense, whether it be internal from my team uh, or myself, or, uh, you know, we are been doing this for a long time and are have a lot of music supervisor friends. Um, and uh, there's many a time when a music supervisor's showrunner or someone they have a relationship is coming into a project and we're just asked by the studio what, what do you think of these guys and or this girl or what and you know, a lot of time we're like we know them very well they know what they're doing we're happy to make that deal happen and and help the filmmaker get to creatively get to the other side of what they want musically so yeah. it's a it's a it's a 
it can it's a micro and a macro view just depending on the project uh, opposed to being a music supervisor comes in and is focused just on that project um, we touch almost every project and we probably supervise well we're we're busy we're supervising a, a lot of them or there's sometimes there's a project that doesn't need a full-time music supervisor they just need someone to help them figure out who their composer's going to be and they may have a song here or there and we feel that need to yeah so not just from hbo but obviously i'm sure there were so many things that came through from them but also from others were there ever any projects that you passed on that you regret not kind of taking the reins on well i'm sure if i thought about it you, you know I, I might cry but i would i would say generally the the, the first half of neophonics uh professional life you you know we 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 tried to get as much as we could and we very rarely said no. Um, I think now if we are too busy, then we're very transparent about that. You know, that, that I, I feel like you know, part of my job is to evaluate what's best for the project. And if, if we're super busy and working on a lot of things, sometimes we think, we think you need someone to do this it's not us. Oh, you're you're going to be in New York, and you have a lot of cam on cameras in New York. Why don't we get you someone that's adept there uh, and can be on the ground for you? And there's plenty of great soups out there, um, or in the UK, or wherever it happens to be. So, yeah, yes. Now, sometimes I say n no, but um, yeah, I'm sure if I out of there's projects that we w wanted to do and we didn't get uh, outside of HBO, let's say, but you know, that's that's okay. So, yeah. Someone probably that we knew really well and liked a lot got the gig instead. Such a good way to look at it. Everyone, everyone kind of is right for the projects that they end up on. So um, speaking of the right fit, um, Obviously, Game of Thrones is one of HBO's biggest successes. How did you first begin working with Ramin Javadi and how, I mean, I know he wasn't the original composer for yeah. him. So how did you kind of bring him in and know that he would be the perfect fit? Well, so they, um, we were, we were in the midst of our consulting deal, of course, and um, they were shooting the pilot and um, they, found a composer they wanted uh, outside of our involvement and they and they hired that composer and pretty quickly um, felt that it was not the right move and uh, I got a call from uh, the uh, HBO execs post exec and said can you come watch the, this pilot and meet with Dan and Dave uh, and Carolyn the, the, the producers and just talk about music and tell them what you think. So I um, went in and watched the, the pilot and um, they were already in the midst of talking about what reshoots they were gonna do before the series started and all of that. Um, but I watched the, the pilot and literally, I didn't realize that they were gonna be like, so who should we hire? Uh, but we started to have a creative conversation. I said, you need someone like Ramin Javadi. Like he seems like he's fresh and he's like, who and they quickly got on their computers and looked him up and like this sounds great and i'm like oh wait i don't even know if he's like available but he was just creatively what popped out of my head and and uh i then ended up calling the agent because they were excited by the idea of him they saw some of his credits they thought was can we meet him and and so i initially had to convince ramin because he was busy that he should take a look at this and come and meet dan and dave and um I, I asked the agent for Ramin's home number and called him on a weekend and convinced him. I said, I will, if you're too busy after you meet them, uh, it's on me. I will help you get out of it. He watched it. They loved each other. You know, Dan and Dave and Ramin clicked. Uh, we had to work around some logistics of the projects he was doing, but that, that's how Ramin and I started our friendship. And I literally talked to Ramin Monday. Like, we were really good friends. And... Um, we're talking about a 2LP um, kind of uh, anniversary vinyl for record day this April 
that would be kind of some of the interesting outtakes and some of the things that didn't make the soundtracks over the eight seasons and some of the greatest hits um uh but we were riffing on that and plan to get together in the next coming weeks to put that together for water tower to release in april cool i love that and obviously there was so much other music that went into that i mean florence and the machine wow I, there are so many big things but that's a st standout for me can you talk about how that, that, that was that was re really organic so when we were in season two and we reigns of castamere which was written in in the books and translated into the scripts um dan and dave brought up florence at, at the time so season two and then um she was doing some other big feature film she was doing something that was really busy and couldn't you know so this is at the end of season one and we're thinking about season two um and wasn't uh, av available to do it and we end up doing an, an amazing version of Rain's Casimir with the National yeah. that came out in season two, which has been like a staple and it was, yeah, it's so it was a hit. It was fantastic and it was really fun to go in the studio with those guys and Ramin and create that track. It was just a lot, a lot of fun. But but fast forward and um, Jenny of Old Stone shows up in episode two of season eight. I think it's episode two of season eight. And we're, we're all at Rabin's house talking uh, about cuts, talking about the season. And, and we said, we literally just like, it just popped up. Those guys were like, what about? And I'm like, yeah, we should go back to Florence. We should see. And, and so I got a hold of management and we had a, a long, kind of a long back and forth of like, this is what it is. Ramin did a little bit of a, um, had done a little bit of a, de a demo, a, just a piano demo, and so so melody and stuff, and we we got that to Florence to listen to. She lo she loved it. She thought it was really beautiful and and a kind of a lullaby, and and uh, and then we we connected uh, Thomas Bartlett, who she had worked with before, to come and pr to help produce the track, and went back and forth, and she of course crushed it, as we all know, um, and. Um, there you go. The end credit. For the um, for the Throne album, kind of the similar question: Were there other artists who worked on their own versions, either as well as the Florence one, or as as well as some of the other? I mean, obviously, for those who don't know, the album is like The Weekend, Marin Morris, X Ambassadors, Ellie Golding. Like you, you L pull together kind of such an A list. The Lumineers, the Ambassadors. Yeah. Um, were all of Matt those Bellamy, Matt Bellamy from Muse? Yeah. Uh, Mumford and Sons. It was that was a that was a lot a lot of fun. And uh, Rick, Ricky Reed, you know, the great producer writer, he he was kind of the catalyst, and you know touched most of these tracks. And the Lumineers wrote wrote, wrote in them, set there so themselves and produced it. And and so did P Pray by Matt Bellany. But but Ricky really had his fingers in, and that was a lot of fun being in Ricky's studio watching stuff go down and. Um, really a lot of fun and a very diverse record yeah for sure and i know you love like we talked about earlier those music intensive projects um you spent a lot of time in the studio with uh queen latifah in atlanta for bessie can you talk about that i mean that is what a, another legend yeah so so um she was we were we were teeing up the show to get a green light and and as those pieces were coming together we were getting closer and closer to the production date and the script was as you know i mean just tons of music like i think we created seven different on-camera bands and there's probably 40 songs in the in the in the movie um but dana queen latifah was doing a television talk show uh television show daily show and so when we finally got the green light and we're doing it we had you know we, she was stretched thin but she's such a pro and such a talent we started by um just working out keys and working out tempos and vibes in los angeles at the village and at capitol 
Um, and Larry Seaberth, who's a, he's a trad piano player out of Louisiana, I brought him in. He literally lived in Los Angeles for a while. And as we kind of put this stuff together and we, and we did the pre-records to as many tracks as we could here in Los Angeles. But she needed to get to Atlanta because we were going into pre-production and she needed to work in the rehearsals. So we kind of moved ourselves. I literally spent the summer in, in um, Atlanta and par parked in a couple of different studios, silent sound in Atlanta and stuff. And we started to, when she would literally be in, she would either be working or she would be in makeup or rehearsals. And then at night she would come to the studio and we would work out getting her vocals on the tracks. And, and we had, of course, we had a Ma Rainey character and we had to cast her vocally. And, and um, so there was a lot, lots of studio time. And then what, and we were bouncing between the studio and then, then we finished something and we might have to be on set the next day. So it was somewhat sleepless depending on what, where we were in the shooting schedule, but really, really exciting. And, and one of my dearest friends who passed away last year, Ed Cherney, um, great music producer, engineer. Um, I flew him, we, we did all the tracks together here in Los Angeles, and, we, and I flew him to Atlanta and we hung out and worked together on, uh, on all that. And he had such a great uh, disposition and sense of humor that when we were exhausted, he would just crack jokes and we would power through. And um, well, a really special time uh, for me, just as far as making music was concerned, and being part of a a bit a bigger team to really make things happen on a super music driven show, of course, yeah, it's about business. Obviously, yeah, of course, and and you won an Emmy for it, which is a huge yeah Emmy. with Ed. Yeah, exactly. So love that. Um, for I mean, I've obviously heard you talk about other favorite projects. I know Bessie was one, but you. Uh, have talked extensively about how much you've loved working on behind the candelabra. What was? Can you share a little? Yeah, bit about that that's another that's another one of those you know sh shows, the movies that had so much music and it was so integrated um, in, into you know Liberace's story. You cannot tell the story without his music, and and that's what he was about, and. Um, so that, that was, you know, Marvin Hamlish came in to work on all the arrangements and all of that stuff. And as we know, M M Marvin didn't make it through, through the project. He, he, he sadly passed away during the project. And, and, and we had um, Rick, Randy Kerber, who's an incredible pianist, recreate all of uh, Liberace's tracks. We, we went to the estate and got some, some of the charts, but literally had transposed everything and Randy came in and crushed all of all of those piano parts and um, it, it was it was another one of those the team gets together and makes it happen. We had to cast Michael Douglas body double, not just hand double, body double. Wow. And um, so there was lots of integrity. We had to put together an orchestra in Las Vegas because we wanted to we wanted to um, and yeah, we actually, Stephen, Stephen wanted to shoot those music scenes in the hotel that Liberace used to be in. And, and uh, so we put together a lot of musicians out of uh, Vegas um, and actually found the body double in Vegas too, um, doing a, a Liberace show. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, that, was, that was a great, that was a great project. Yeah, and, and it's very challenging, obviously, so complicated. Um. Yeah, there was lot, lots of uh, on cameras, there was lots of uh, ear, ear wigging for, for Michael so he could hear the music because he had dialogue in between and we couldn't have playback um, being recorded onto the dialogue. We had to keep that discreet, so he was wearing an ear wig a lot of the time and because he would stop in between playing and he would talk to the audience and sometimes the audience would talk back, his mother talked back, you know, lots of those kinds of things. So, and we also had in the big finale, a lot of um, dancers and all sorts of choreographed stuff. So there was a lot of um, play, specialty playback. We were literally editing on the set to, you know, help the timing of the dance and, and to satisfy Steven Soderbergh's requests. 
uh, on camera. Um, but it's another one of those ones that I think back on that were like, you know, completely immersed for a really long time, you know, did some living in a hotel and, and uh, uh, re really enjoyed the project. So cool. Well, I'm going to pivot a little bit from past stuff to future stuff. And in that time, I just dug into some chat questions. And man, there are so many fun people in the I'm audience. Seeing, I'm seeing all the chat stuff, but I I'm know. talking to you. And I'm like, oh, should I say, should I say, say, say something? Some and I saw hops, some, he hops on there and a few so people I know. And um, yeah, some Anacrusis past interns and then some Neophonic past interns, Lily Streeter. <laughs> it's like so many fun really? people. Uh, oh yeah, look at this. I love my experience at Neophonic. Good on you, Lily. Right? <laughs> so um, we are paying attention to the, to the chat. If you do have questions, feel free to pop them in there. Um, but just to pivot to some exciting upcoming stuff, um, you've talked a lot about Warrior, which I feel like is such an amazing combination of meldings of genres. Well, and, I mean, can you just share some of initially yeah, so, about that? So the Warrior, Warrior is done. Season yeah. one came out last year. Season two, I think it was last. Yeah, season yeah, two is yep. just just out now, but we finished Warrior a, a while ago, and and I had mentioned that when we were just ch chatting because it's because it's it's one of those unique things where we 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 broke the fourth wall a little bit, but we did it in in a selective way. That it's it's eighteen ninety Chinatown in San Francisco, and we're dealing with Chinese Tong Wars and. And the opium trade and prostitution and and a lot of martial arts and it's and it there's a and it's very very authentic except for a few little exceptions like they're wearing one of the one of the tongs is wearing armani suits and their and their dialogue and the dialect is a little contemporary um but but otherwise we don't really we don't really break break the wall and it's and and um when we were putting together the pilot uh, Jonathan Tupper is a showrunner and creator. Um, we were going back and forth with like, oh, like contemporary hip hop beats underneath a score, and and we went through a whole casting thing to find the right composer. But when we were putting together the temp, we ended up taking a piece of a temping a hip hop song, a Chinese hip hop song. Actually, I don't think it was Chinese. It was a hip hop song in the end credits, and then we then flipped it later and made it a Chinese hip hop track and then I pitched Jonathan why don't we end each end credit with with Chinese speaking hip hop um, and uh, we, it turned into a little bit of a task because we of course had to go combing for that music but then we had to get it translated so we knew what they were talking about because I don't speak Chinese and uh, or Mandarin or any any of those dialects and and um, but we started finding some really good connections and re really cool tracks. Some were a little bit more pop, some were a little more rock, but you know, hip hop by and large. And then we, uh, meeting some of those people, engaged some people to write music for the show. And then we started doing mashups. Like in this season, we have a Spanish. Uh, they go to they go to Mexico. Our our protagonists go to Mexico, so we've got um, a hip hop track that's Chinese, English, and Spanish. And we took oh, cool. like me, like classic Mexican horns and put that into the track and and just had a blast creating music for for that show and um, what, one, like one of one of those one of those ones we there's a lot to, to chew you know there's a lot of to do um, in that way of creating music and, and and kind of discovering the genre that I didn't know a lot about when we started. Yeah, I feel like obviously there is so much of that genre melding happening in music in general. Do you feel like that is becoming a big thing with merging, obviously, the Asian influence, the Latin influence, the Hispanic? I mean, so many different world influences into film, television. What are you seeing kind of? Yeah, I, th I think that's true. I think you're spot on. I think there's a there, there there's there's. You know, English is the world language, but there's lots and lots of cool hybrids happening, and we're a global, we're a global culture, and you know, those lines have been cro crossed and melding, and and it's now being reflected in music in so many different ways, and it's 
it's really cool. It's it's um, it's really refreshing and you know, put put yourself in a different space in discovering those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm super excited about that stuff. How would you say that some of that relationship between film and music and music discovery through film do you feel has shifted over the years in your career? Well, one is we talked about it a little bit, just the 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 realization of the screen being such a big tool for for bands um, and for the explosion of content in the film and TV world with with streaming and with yeah. all the Netflix and Amazon and all these different so that so you know when you used to make uh, I don't know 150 shows a, a year you know off of all cross platforms you're probably making you know thousands thousands, yeah. thousands. so you're covering a lot of different topics and it's opening up uh, music for a lot of different genres and people and artists and and um, I think it's just a it, it's just a progression of of like what well, where technology is kind of rushing that meld the inevitable you know meld and it's giving giving people in all cultures exposure to lots of different stuff and it yeah. certainly is exciting for a music supervisor that's been doing this work for a long time in that I'm not just finding a pop piece for a blah blah now I'm oh we're doing a project that's based in Russia or we did Chernobyl and you know we we, we explored Russian music and Russian pop music and it was really fun and I and I you know if you look at what's out there and what's popular across all the different platforms um, there's lots of opportunity there's lots of opportunity for music, uh, oh, both in the broad yeah. pop sense and in the very, uh, very niche sense. You know, I think that I think the, the the music industry or music is very, very healthy. You know, platforms and delivery systems aside, and streaming versus downloads versus all that shifting all the streaming is one thing. That's mechanics, but just music in general. I think you have. The ability to reach and hear. If you're if you're a if you're a bluegrass fan, you can find an indie label out of Europe that features bluegrass with a couple of clicks, and and that was not available. And the same thing applies, I think, to television and film. Like we're, it's just such a broader base of genres now because of the amount of content. Absolutely, yeah. How has this year? been different obviously everything's impacted every piece of the industry but how, I mean we had one of the questions that the audience asked was have you had to do like vocal pre-records has that been different obviously I mean we've seen projects that have been paused have you had projects that have been able to continue yeah bo both yeah there I mean, when when we um when the when when COVID started to lock things down I don't know when was that, you know, March, February, March, February, March. And um, we were working on a lot of things and HBO had a lot of projects that had just finished production um, and stuff and some that were just about to start and some that just had started. Excuse me. So everything that was to had just started or was about to start was put on hold. Nobody knew what this was nobody knew what and it was just a, an absolute l l lockdown we stayed busy because we had a lot of projects that were in post they had to do there was a lot of scrambling to put editors out of a you know a common area at a at a post facility in their own homes with editing equipment so they could keep working and there was a lot of reviewing cuts and stuff like we are talking now you know, on digital platforms and watching and making notes and not in person interaction. Um, I feel like we're just getting all of those things that we could work on finished. And it feels like production is starting up now. Like yeah. I've seen schedules and things 
There's shows we're working on that are shooting. There's shows that we're almost done. They're now coming to finish the last 20 days of shooting, those kinds of things. So um, g generally speaking, I'm, I feel very positive and encouraged that product production is working its way back in and all my brethren and friends that do what we do are going to have gigs and stuff to work work on so 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 that's great and the, there's lots of protocols and things are more expensive and um yeah. i mean we even we've been outfitting a studio for our writers and so much studio equipment is back ordered because everyone is ordering things to work from home oh yeah yeah right that's and wild you're seeing that as well with just like that what's needed to do what you do at home you you know everything is you have to order more things and it's become so much more expensive to do but so yeah i'll give you i'll give you an example so look, look uh, laura cartman and rafael sadiq are doing lovecraft country for hbo and there is a do it in your own studio element but there's also an orchestral element to it a big orchestral element to it and um we literally had you know uh orchestrators and copyists create parts and Laura sent them out to individual string players in their homes with sessions set up and they played their part and in you know so 20 string players are all playing their parts and then delivering it back to the engineer who's comping it all back together and editing it to the picture and mixing all the other elements together so we did an orchestra player by player um and it worked it worked great it was very arduous but it, it but it worked yeah. great and but i'm hearing now that studios are opening up and there's certain protocols you know it's it's different to record a string player because they are not blowing air through something and and where, where that, that could be an issue as far yeah. as uh, contaminating people um but, uh, and, but there is there is sessions now happening um yeah, I mean, which is really which is, is so, which is nice so amazing to see what we can all do with technology the fact that we can the fact that you can record an entire orchestra from every from 50 different people's living rooms you know it's kind of the irony that the pandemic wouldn't have hit as hard had it happened 30 years ago but we never would have been able to do what we can do in oh. the pandemic yeah and you know i i think the pandemic as far as as far as technology or as far as what we're doing right now which is you know on a zoom chat and and a lot of people working from home i think that were, we were trending you know there was a lot of a lot of productions where wherever the director was they wanted to set up post there instead of los angeles or new york or, or atlanta or like you know like and, and, and when this happened all of those things that were starting to trend accelerated and like okay well for us to keep moving, we have to shift gears. It's like, should we have bought Zoom stock in February or something? <laughs> Probably, right? You know, like, but all of that shift. And at first, it was like, it was a challenge to figure out. I mean, I would, I, I, I still, I'm in my office right now. I've still Jones to, I'm in my house. Like, see, see, see people and and uh, yeah. do it. And I, and the other thing that actually the pendulum swinging, where you would sometimes just have a quick phone conversation. Now, a lot of those have turned into Zoom calls and stuff like, you know, like I have my camera off because I'm in my pajamas, you know, like you, know, you really don't want to see me right now. Like, um, I know almost everything. I feel like I'm just FaceTiming everyone now instead of calling them. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's interesting. How far will the pendulum swing back? How how like, you know, Big big recording studios and people doing their whole album at home. That was kind of trending any anyway, you know, as far as the record business is concerned. So uh, it's it's interesting to see how um, resilient people are and and get your right. Technology has a huge amount to do with that, and certainly would not have been able to do that back in the day. Yeah, um, we have a question from the audience about what was the most challenging project that you've ever worked on. I would, I would probably say the two convers the two topics, the two projects, behind the candelabra and um, Bessie Smith were very challenging because there was so many different uh, voices that we were casting and Bessie, so many different bands we put together, casting on camera bands, making overall deals for Bessie Smith's catalog and Ma Rainey's catalog and all of that, and 
Um, and, and the same with so much on camera work for Brian the Candelabra. Another one that earlier in my career was the Rat Pack that we had lots of lots of on cameras and Frank Sinatra singing and Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin and, and had to voice them and do all of those things. Uh, um, that was another really challenge. Any, any, I, I, liked, I liked the challenge and I think at the end of the day, the most rewarding ones are the ones that are really, really musically intensive. Yeah, I love- Hopefully that answers the question in a broad way. Yeah, that's one of our fav my favorite things. Some of the people in the chat, I'm flattered, want to hear about some of the things we're working on, but um, one of my- What are you working on? Well, I was gonna say similarly working with our writers on specific projects, kind of getting everyone in the studio. It's one of the things we've been struggling to do with virtual writing camps, obviously throughout this pandemic, but finding a safe space that we can probably, you know, hopefully bring people back together um, to write and bring people into the studio. And so working with supervisors to brief, but also writing for bigger films and bigger things. And um, so that's working in the studio with the writers is one of my favorite things too. And of course, like being able to see something, the day it's written, the idea, and then kind of see it flushed out and then see the supervisor get excited and then see it land in right. a really significant way is one of my favorite things to be able to kind of be a part of every step. And then to see the artist celebrate after and be able to use that $30,000 to make their next record or tour, right. or whatever that looks like. Um, it's a different puzzle when you're creating music that has to fit as part of a cog in a wheel. There's the visual, there's the director, there's the props, there's casting, there's all these different things. And music is has one piece opposed to a self-created thing. You're putting out a record, it's all about you. There's a different dynamic when you have to take into consideration what you're writing for and in what medium you're writing in. in you know, there's I could tell I could tell some stories about an art, you know, we were in the studio doing doing a track and the and the, and the artist is is they're laying guitar work over a really intimate scene, and the artist is like, that dialogue's getting in the way of my guitar. And I'm like, well, probably should think about that. Maybe we should play less notes on the guitar or wait to this part of the dialogue is, you know, one of those kinds of conversation. And it is an art form, you know. You're, it's good that you're you're having these camps or these sessions with them because yeah. look, look, understanding the visual and understanding what whether you need to be on the nose, whether you need, if you're playing against something, um, if you're if you're playing the subconscious, like all of those things to what the visual is, it's it's a it's a songwriter's art form. It's really it really has its own um, set of parameters that need need to be thought about, like ho hopefully transparently thought about, so you're not. Over, overthinking, you're you're remaining creative, and you're you're you're, you're still writing from that place, that creative place. Um, but it is a different discipline for sure. Absolutely, yeah. Some of our writers have really excelled in that and love that challenge, and others are like, no, I think I think I want to write about what I want to write about, <laughs> and that's you know totally fine. So it's it is interesting, just kind of. It, it's an assignment, you know, it's not, right. it's not going in and writing what you're feeling today. It really is like thinking about it and it's an assignment to write. Yeah, what are all those characters feeling? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, someone just asked a question, where, where do you go to find new repertoire and music? I've heard since music supervision, a lot of work, you want all the people that can trust, tips, writers, composers. So, uh, um, it come it, just to answer that question really quickly. It comes from all over. You know, I, I I've been doing this for a really long time, and there's three other music supervisors here at Neophonic, and uh, all of them have relationships with people, and have been doing this for for a period of time. So I I have relationships at labels and publishers, independent labels, production houses. You know, uh, people like Riptide or. Ocean Park that broker lots of different artists and independent labels and bank robber and all those people that represent a bunch of small labels or a bunch of artists and and we so we we lean into that community depending on the project not only genre but like oh this is a this is a full blown we have enough money to be able to go broad 
and pay what would be industry standards. Oh, we don't. So we have to, we go to you know a different set of people that were, are more willing to be uh, price friendly. And so we kind of tailor our blasts out to the community looking for stuff um, based on a lot of set of parameters. But so that I know I'm not really specifically answering to say, for, except to say from all over, depending on the project. Um, Which I, I'll just jump in and say one of the things that um, I think is really helpful for some of the artists and writers in the audience is if you have music that is discoverable, which hopefully you do, also have some way to contact you. So if you have music on SoundCloud, have your email or your manager's email, or you know, if you have just some way to reach out to, because I've been supervising projects and I've talked to other supervisors that find music in the most obscurest ways, but then we can't figure out how to use it. Um, yeah, as simple as literally your metadata containing information to be able to, to talk talk to you. And, yeah. you know, I, I would say I'm not really into physical, pro getting physical, pro I'm a, I collect vinyl, but, but I'm not in like being pitched in the old days, I would get records or I'd get CDs or I'd get cassettes and like dozens and dozens and dozens, but everything is in the digital age is so easy that link having links that are not only downloadable, but streamable. Because if yeah. I'm not about to, and nor my team about to download hundreds and hundreds of songs onto our hard drive that we don't know anything about, but if I can quickly click on something and stream a little bit of it and go, oh my God, that fits this project, then I would go back and download all of that stuff that is needed. So I, 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 uh, just to follow Liz's, uh, trajectory on the conversation, I would say, make sure there's metadata, make sure your stuff is streamable as well as downloadable. Um, and there's lots and lots of people that, that represent musicians and artists and, and have relationships with a lot of people. And it's not a bad thing to connect with them. They're out looking for talent to be able to pitch for film and TV to their relationships. And if they take 25% of the sync fee, who cares if you're getting exposure, you know, I'm not saying they do, they probably, some, probably take more, some probably take less, but I'm just saying generally speaking to have somebody out there that has relationships pitching your project is, is a good, is a good way to reach m multiple people. And there's already a trust with those people that we have that the last thing that you want is not having your music together. You know, we hear something that's really great, but we realize, you're just one person in the band and you all wrote it together and they can't agree on something and you you can't necessarily represent all of them and the, and the ducks aren't in a row. We have one of those experiences and we usually probably write off that area as pro problematic or that source is problematic. So have your, have your act together, you know, and, and make sure that all the people that are involved um, are agreeing with you and that, that you know you can make a deal on every everyone's behalf writers and uh, performers on the flip side for the people in the audience who are wanting to be music supervisors do you have any words of wisdom or thoughts advice uh, uh, i would literally i would say go work for a music supervisor yeah i think they, they i thought you were pretty, getting ready to thought you're getting ready just to, to get her to leave uh <laughs> That what what one one is you know music music supervise small projects music supervise a short somebody's uh, film project for school get, do some of those things go and go in to some of the guild of music supervisor sessions to meet people but but if you want to kind of get into the get into it quickly go to work for some go to work for a music supervisor yeah. help them out work work for free do any, any any way you can get to start to understand and build your relationships and understand the mechanics of music supervision you you know there's a lot of people that in, interned here that are now I'm happy to say are now working professionally in, in in the entertainment business in one way or another not all music supervisors but using it as a stepping stone to meet people to be able to put something on their resume that says I understand this medium and I worked in this and these are the things I've done. So I think I'm ready to take this next step. 
I know yeah. how to clear music, license music. Yeah. Yeah, I understand BMI and ASCAP and CSAC and and and, and just all of the revenue and performance money and what a cue sheet is and there's a, there's a lot of things that are not that um, foreign but just need uh, a, a, li a little bit of structure and understanding to kind of you, you know know what you're doing a bit and then the actual exercise of doing it enough to be proficient at it yeah well hey real quick before we wrap a fun question from the audience was what is the most you've ever paid to license a track hmm. no? <laughs> uh well it wasn't well, the, the most we paid to license one track was a couple hundred thousand dollars on a TV and film project. The most we've ever paid an artist to use multiple songs was a million. Wow. Can you say what project that was? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, everyone's. And, but it, it, it really ranges. Like, oh, we, might pay, we might pay, and I'm sure everybody in the audience does, yeah. might, we might pay a grand for a song, we might pay 50 grand for a song. You, you know, um, depends on the artist, depends on the rights that we're going after, um, the, you know, the structure. There's a lot of things that, that, that go, in, go into it. Absolutely. So fun. Well, thank you so much. I, yeah, it was a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Of, I know. I can't think of a better person, better way to get some invite, advice for everyone in the Nashville community. And the, I mean, there are so many people attuning and I'm watching this chat from New York, from LA, from London. So fun to see everyone. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. All yeah, your my, my pleasure. Your time with us this afternoon. And, and Tom, Tom, thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you to you both. This has been a, awesome. I could honestly listen to another hour for sure. Uh, Liz, it's always a pleasure to see you. And Evian, you've got a, a new fan in Nashville and several new fans across the world from today. And so thank awesome. you for doing what you do. And we look forward to remaining in touch. Let me say to the audience, thank you for your time today. I want to encourage everyone to continue to be nice to each other and go vote in two weeks. Wear yes. Hat and stay safe. Take care, folks. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye.